So in the aftermath of the tragic murder of six hostages just days ago, it seems like it may have happened once they sensed the IDF were closing in. Um, there's been protests in Israel, mass protests. It seems there's been several hundred thousand that have been protesting. But what's so difficult and so tragic and painful is that the protests seem to be directed in an internal place, not at Hamas, but inwards at their own people, their own government. And this is so tragic. I saw a post of Beryl Solomon who said the worst thing that can happen in Israel is Jews blaming Jews for what monsters have done to us. It's unimaginable really to think of another people or society who would feel like the onus is with them and their own leaders when this is something that happened to us it's so important as painful as it is that we get moral clarity on this issue because i fear that the protest that we're seeing will only so more chaos, more division, more problems. I know many people feel deeply disappointed with Israel's leadership for a number of reasons, and criticism come from all, can come from all sides and from all angles. But this notion that somehow there was a deal that could have been done that it was really a choice not to save them is so morally and just realistically confused that it needs ironing out because I fear that this kind of uh, protests and an anger that we're seeing directed at our own people is not only not healthy, but it's misconstruing reality. And in some ways, if we think about what was happening prior to October 7th, um, there was Israel was torn by divisions. Um, and some people said that they felt that this led Israel to no longer have their eye on the ball, on the security ball. So we can't go back to this place. And I, I have to ask some questions around those who are creating these sort of ceasefire now protests inside of Israel, where they seem to have this reality in which the government have chosen not to save the hostages and that a ceasefire and would, would in some way solve all, all the problems. Let's be clear. First of all, according to the intelligence uh, reports and from what seems to be um, kind of reported by Israeli intelligence uh, reporters or experts, there was no great deal that Hamas were offering that would have allowed Israel to salvage the hostages. Hamas aren't even showing up to the hostage um negotiations and the, and the ceasefire negotiations and meetings and when they do have prices the price tag is simply too high and we need to have a conversation as uncomfortable and painful as it is about the principle that negotiating for hostages when it means that you end up releasing murderers, terrorists, is not a moral thing to do, according to Jewish morality, and I think according to logic. And when people say to me, Ollie, how, how would you feel if you were the mother, father of, um, of, of a hostage? 
first of all, I couldn't begin to imagine the pain that f- family and friends of hostages are feeling. I couldn't even begin. And every single day I pray, Hashem, please protect all the hostages from rape, pain, mutilation, injury, abuse, death. Please bring them home to their family immediately. It's the first thing on my lips in prayer every single day. And I hope that the IDF can can get hold of them. But I, you can't really have these um, emotional arguments and ignore the the, the the reason, the morality behind it. It's the same way if someone said to me, Ollie, you know, I, I, I respond by saying, it's the same way if you said to me, what if you had a an Arab child in Gaza? Well, I therefore, so are you, are you therefore saying that I would therefore have to say, well, Israel shouldn't go into Gaza? These are emotional arguments. Yes, there is going to be deep pain in making decisions on these fronts, but it doesn't mean that you can ignore the morality or immorality of these issues. So how could we ignore the fact that when in the last deal there was huge pressure, just like what we're seeing now in these protests, 10 years ago, huge pressure for the government to do a deal to release Gilad Shalit. And what did then, uh, I think it was Netanyahu do, he released a thousand Arab prisoners, one of which was Sinwar, to, to, to retake uh, and rescue Shalit. One of those released was Sinwar. Sinwar, who was responsible for October 7th. I read even recently that one of the prisoners that was released in the recent hostage deal has gone on to try to kill Jews. Israelis. So it's not so simple as, oh, you just do a deal and you get your people back. More blood has been spilled as a result. Secondly, there's a very dangerous precedent that you set. Your enemies take your people hostage and then you do a deal and you give them what they want. What do you tell them? taking hostages pays. It it works. So you keep doing it. Contrary to thinking that you're saving hostages, you actually make every single Israeli a potential hostage. You hold all of Israel hostage when you negotiate with terrorists. So unfortunately, these protesters, who, by the way, I, I don't think represent a majority, certainly don't represent a majority of Jews and Israelis. Yes, there's lots of pain and angst and upset with uh, with the government, but to say that they somehow represent Israelis in wanting for a, a ceasefire and, and a, 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 a negotiation at any price, they don't. But let's be clear that this notion of ceasefire now and everything will be fine is is a fantasy that there's a deal on the table it's so dangerous these people think they're preaching peace actually what they're preaching is more war you show weakness to your enemy you show you're prepared to do deals you're prepared to give them ceasefires when they go and genocide your people all you do is embolden your enemies to do more when other arab armies are fighting each other they don't take hostages why? Because they know it's not going to pay, it's not going to work. The other side won't do any deal to, to rescue them or to, to, you know, to negotiate for them, to, to trade them. The way you recover the hostages is through military might and pressure. All kinds of pressure, which Israel might not even be fully utilizing, perhaps because of international pressure. But it is very concerning to see the division that we saw prior to October 7th starting to creep in. And you know what? It's, it's exactly what Hamas wants. They knew. They knew that there'd be this kind of division because so many Israelis have a heart, because they want peace, because they hate to see bloodshed, even if they might understand it's necessary. But this is the point. We can't lose sight of what is morally necessary. We can't become so weak and timid that we're unable to do what we need to do.
I want to read to you a few things I've seen online recently. This is David Hazoni. And he said, our Israeli uh, discourse has suffered from the lack of sovereign wisdom and an unwillingness to have the hard conversations about the hostages and what causes the enemy to take them in the first place and again in the future. And there are powerful political forces aiming to make sure that continues to be the case. He said, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying all protest movements are cynical manipulations by political forces that fuel them. I'm just saying that anything with power will automatically be noticed by cynical political forces. Because sometimes protest movements work. Cynical political forces will do what they can to build them or commandeer them for their purposes. Which means you can't trust them at face value. The people on the ground are often not ultimately determining the messaging, the timing and locations and the conditions under which they'd be willing to stop. They often aren't setting the agenda, somebody else's. So, every protest movement that should be approached with a critical eye. Suppose those you agree with, sure, but always ask yourself, what's weird about how they're doing it? Why are those who oppose war in Gaza, for example, calling for ceasefire rather than peace? Why does another protest have no concrete de demands or demands that aren't applicable in the real world? Ask yourself, who would want to cover the cost of this protest? Which high resource political forces might benefit from it? For me, the most important line in what David has said here is why don't they have concrete demands? They just scream, they're angry, they say do a deal. I don't even know what deal there is to be done. It's a fantasy to think that there's some kind of wonderful deal that could solve all the problems overnight. So all this is doing is just sowing chaos. By the way, you should know there's recently been a counter process where bereaved families of soldiers have been d demanding that the government absolutely continue with the fighting in Gaza. This was reported on Ynet. But I think the most painful thing of all, because I'm sure there's many goodwill people, no doubt, at these protests as well, the most painful thing of all is somehow how we end up blaming ourselves, thinking that, oh, it's because we haven't done enough, because we could have got that deal. We... This is so painful. It's part of our inferiority complex. It's like an abused spouse that starts to believe that everything they do is wrong. It's what leads to self-hating Jews. It's what leads to these kind of sense of constant guilt and we're so bad, we're terrible, and believing the world's hate towards us and anger towards us. The second you just acknowledge how much more human tragedy and suffering and conflict there are with so many high numbers of casualties in so many other parts of the world, if you just acknowledge that for a second, you realize that it's not sincere, the world's obsession with Israel in terms of obsessive uh, decrying of Israel, lamenting of Israel, accusing Israel of being all these terrible things. But this is the biggest problem of all in some ways, our inferiority complex, turning on ourselves, blaming ourselves. Not surprising, after 2000 years of persecution, exile, suffering, hatred, not surprising we have this complex, but we have to dust it off. And it's so important that even if a few are, a few are trying to maybe not intentionally, but are creating division, chaos. Jewish people and Israelis need to stand firm in understanding what needs to be done, the truth and morality of what needs to be done, and pushing back against fantasies. You know the line, peace through strength, but I've started to say that we need to add before that to get that strength you need to have truth. You need to understand the truth. You understand the truth, both the moral truth and the truth of what's actually the reality on the ground. That is what gives you the strength to keep going, to stand firm. And through that strength, you get long lasting peace. That's what we're ultimately seeking anyway. And that's what perhaps is misunderstood is that those calling for ceasefire and deals are, are just uh, leading to more perpetual conflict. In some ways, they are the real warmongers. Those who want to do what you do, 
to provide lasting long-term peace, which means destroying the security threats, going after Hamas, destroying them, Hezbollah, Iran. Ironically, though it may not seem it, they are the true peacemakers. Thank you so much for watching. To watch another one, click here. To stay up to date with all our content, click here to subscribe. And if you're able to, you can help support JTV to grow and grow by clicking join below this video, where you can become a member and get perks, including early access to videos and private live discussions with me. But most of all, you'll be partnering with us on our mission to change the world.